Hello, welcome everybody. We're back on uh, Rethink, uh, the design festival. This is our first online edition, our third uh, uh, edition overall. And uh, we started this uh, two days ago, three days ago, and uh, we're here with uh, Casey Kleins. Uh, I'll tell you more about him in a minute. Uh, I'm Guido Romeo. I'm a journalist and a, a longtime friend of Rethink. Uh, this is my third run, uh, th third year with uh, Rethink, and uh, I get this. It just keeps getting better and better. Uh, so a few uh, housekeeping uh, communications. Uh, uh, if you want, this is meant to be a very interactive uh, session. So you may ask uh, KZ questions, uh, but you will have to go through a few steps. Uh, it's very simple. You either uh, shoot us questions on through our uh, Instagram uh, page on uh, for for the Salone and rethink, and uh, our Facebook page uh, or our YouTube page. Unfortunately, the page on which you're seeing you're seeing us doesn't allow the messaging. But if you write in those pages on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, uh, I will see the questions and I will convey them to. Casey, uh, I must think a great thank a great team that is behind all of this. You don't see them, but they are there. They make all this happen. Uh, Stefano Maffei from uh, Political Design is uh, one of the uh, guys uh, who concede all of this, but he's got a great team. Uh, uh, Raffaella, Beatrice, Gabriele, and Roberto who make this work. Uh, and uh, uh, also our sponsor, PwC, who makes this uh, uh, sustainable and possible. So back to you, Casey. Casey is um, uh, works with Google. He's the lead design for world uh, scale augmented reality, which uh, is a complicated way of saying you have a great, a really fun job, it seems. And uh, we'll be talking about designing for complexity, which is a great. I'm really excited about this, Casey, because I've been a, a science writer for years. I I don't, I don't know how many stories about complexity. So I really want to hear about this. And uh, you combine uh, your expertise in augmented reality also with a past experience in city planning. So you really have the two dimensions, the, the virtual and uh, the real life uh, side of this. On to you, Casey, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Guido. Appreciate the introduction. And, uh, and thank you to Rethink for having me here. It's really exciting. Uh, uh, yeah, gr uh, greetings from New York City. I do wish I could be with, with everyone uh, in Milan and, and elsewhere right now. It'd be, it'd be quite nice, but, uh, but the organizers have done a fantastic job of, of pulling off this, uh, this virtual conference instead, and uh, we'll look forward to drinks together next year. Um, so yeah, today I, I want to, to have a conversation with you about uh, navigating and designing for complexity, and I'll, I'll get into a bit about what that means. Um, and, uh, and hopefully provide some tools uh, for actually doing it. But, but first, um, I'd like to begin by sharing a story about a, a generation of past designers who had really bold ambitions for the future. Among their visions was a new kind of city. And the idea was that this would be a really rational city, uh, an efficient city. What you're looking at here is an early model of a monumental public housing project in St. Louis, Missouri which happens to be the city where I grew up. And this housing project was ultimately built in 1954, and they called it Pruitt Igo. And the idea was that Pruitt Igo was gonna replace the, the really quite terrible living conditions of slums at the time and give penthouse views to their former inhabitants. It was gonna be full of light and air. And, and this project and these buildings were going to solve some of the major problems in the region at that time. And people really believed this story. This master plan community was going to solve so many deeply entrenched problems from public health to poverty to the challenges of the local economy. And uh, it, really, it really was a brave new world, but um, in the end, it would be immortalized as a symbol of failure. So I wanna talk a bit about why it ultimately failed, starting with the epistemology and the worldview that produced it. See, the designers of Pruitt Igo came of age in an era of really massive scientific progress. World War II had ignited major advances in rocketry, 
the first computer languages were being designed alongside the first digital computers. And in 1952, the polio vaccine was developed. One year later, the first color television was made commercially available by RCA. And only a few short years after that, Sputnik, the first satellite, was successfully launched into orbit. And powering these developments was a worldview born in the Enlightenment quite some time before it, which we can call scientific reductionism. And the favorite metaphor of this worldview is the machine. And scientific reductionism basically argues that the whole is the sum of the parts, so that in order to understand a given phenomena, you can break it down into successively smaller constituent components. So in this view, culture or sociology can be reduced to psychology. Psychology can be reduced to biology, biology can be reduced to chemistry, and ultimately chemistry can be reduced to fundamental physics. And in the most extreme reductionist stances, all of life on earth can be explained through the properties of atoms and molecules. And this way of interrogating the world is really effective for solving complicated physical problems. The problem is that designers began to apply scientific reductionism to the complex problems of society and expecting the same results that they found in fields like physics. So they saw the behavior of those uh, physical systems and they began to apply it to social systems. They saw individuals as atomized units of study with no real emergent properties to be found in their interactions. As the sociologist George Simmel described, groping for something tangible, we found only individuals and between them, nothing but empty space. So this was an era of rampant top-down social engineering, perhaps most spectacularly attempted by the Soviet Union in their quest to achieve a centrally planned economy. Modernism took scientific reductionism, which had worked really well in physics, and began trying to apply it to complex social systems. Now, I've mentioned that scientific reductionism was effective at solving complicated physical problems and disastrous at solving complex social problems. Now, I want to be really clear here. It's important to understand the distinction between complicated and complex. See, a complicated system is a system in which the whole is the sum of the parts. It's totally deterministic. So there are no real surprises in a complicated system. It can be understood pretty well by taking it apart and studying its constituent parts in isolation. There's no memory embedded in the system. So a watch, for example, while quite complicated, it can't spontaneously become anything other than a watch. And we can contrast this with complex systems, which are non-deterministic and systems in which the whole can be more than the sum of its parts. Furthermore, it can evolve in unexpected ways and it can't be deconstructed like a complicated system because the behavior of the system depends on the interaction between parts. This is a system that can learn and grow. One example you might be familiar with is a rainforest. So let's go back to Pruitt Igo in St. Louis. What went wrong? Now the answer is a lot of things, but there's a few in particular that I'd like to point out with you today. So first is that in the transition from neighborhood to housing project, individuals and families were effectively extracted from the tight-knit communities that they had grown up in. Some would go to Pruitt Igo, but others wouldn't. Those that did were randomly scattered across 33 buildings on 23 hectares. Individuals were atomized and the social support structures, which are uniquely critical to low-income families virtually anywhere in the world, were broken. Another problem was the homogeneity of the community. Rather than integrating low-income families into mixed-income communities, poverty was concentrated. And more importantly, it was cut off from economic opportunity. This lack of opportunity spelled real trouble because the maintenance of the buildings were solely funded by tenant rent. When it didn't turn out to be enough, rent was raised on the already struggling tenants and things quickly spiraled out of control even further. Over time, conditions deteriorated. And another crucial reason for Pruitt Igo's eventual failure was that the designers didn't see their project as being situated within a larger system. 
for a variety of other reasons, chief among them being the urban demolitions that preceded Pruitt-Igo and an exodus to the suburbs, St. Louis lost 30% of its population in the two decades between Pruitt-Igo being built and its final demolition in the 1970s. It's almost a third of the city gone. Lastly, we can't talk about Pruitt-Igo or the history of St. Louis without addressing the deeply systemic driving force of racism. While it may not have animated the architects of the project itself, it certainly played a role in the policies governing and maintaining the project. The urban exodus that we just talked about was almost exclusively driven by white St. Louisans leaving for the suburbs and then implementing racial covenant laws to keep African-Americans out of their communities. Ultimately, the designers of Pruitt Igo did not grasp the complexity of the problem they had originally set out to solve. Their idea was conceived and managed as a singular solution to a complicated problem, even as the social complexity of the situation consumed everything around it. And I probably don't need to convince you that today we face even bigger and more complex problems. These problems are so big, in fact, that we can see them from space. Sometimes they manifest as masses of people and other times as their complete absence. But they're all the outcome of complex systems, which leaves us today with an all important question. Can design solve big complex problems? And I think the answer is yes, but we need new tools. So today I'd like to argue that we need to move beyond the epistemological tools of the 20th century, like scientific reductionism, and instead we need to look for new conceptual tools. And I believe we can find many in a new form of cutting edge science. Over the last several years, I've become fascinated by an emerging field of study called complexity science. And while my personal interest in complexity science began as pretty much as curiosity, the more that I learned about it, the more I saw that it holds really important lessons for the practice and philosophy of design. And I think these lessons are integral to how we ultimately can solve big complex problems. The computer scientist and the author Melanie Mitchell describes three fundamental characteristics of complex systems. The first of them is complex collective behavior. So complex systems like an ant colony behave according to the interactions of many actors, or to use the terminology of complexity science, agents. So a single ant is not a system. Complexity requires many agents. And the second characteristic of complex systems is that they exhibit signaling and information processing. Agents in the system transmit information to one another, which goes on to influence agent behavior. This visualization of a Twitter network by Eric Gallagher captures the dense network of information signals represented by social media. And lastly, complex systems exhibit adaptation. Behavior change is responding to other agents in the system. Now this may be a matter of learning or it may be achieved through an evolutionary process like the adaptation of the hummingbird's beak to fulfill a viable niche in its environment. And when you add these characteristics together, you get a phenomena known as emergence. Emergence is spontaneous global order as a result of many local interactions between individuals acting according to basic rules. So what you're currently looking at here is a murmuration of starlings. And in the murmuration, there is no leader. Instead, the organic and distinct patterns their trajectories form are the result of collective behavior. Of course, these birds are not aware of the shapes that they're forming here. They're simply processing the information of their nearest neighbor's flight paths and then adapting their own flight path accordingly so that they don't collide. So extremely simple information processing at the local level can produce high order complexity. And it's worth noting here that this emergent order really flies in the face of physics theory of entropy in which order can only decay into disorder. So I hope you can begin to see where the Newtonian physics of universal laws that informed modernism does such a poor job of capturing the nature of complex systems. As one of the earliest complexity scientists once joked, imagine how hard physics would be if electrons could think. <laughs>
And that's the level of the challenges that we face. So one very interesting characteristic of complexity science as a field is that it's drawn thinkers and scholars from a whole variety of disciplines. It's really kind of amazing. In this historical lineage diagram here, you'll see the names of mathematicians, public policy researchers, computer scientists, sociologists, ecologists, and so on. And I think there's two big reasons for this convergence of diverse thinking. The first is that all of those fields and more deal with complex systems even if it may manifest in wildly different ways for each. And then the other reason is that a variety of perspectives is in fact required to understand complex systems. Uh, Donella Meadows, who was one of the originators of general systems theory in the 1970s, once described the ability to transcend paradigms as the most effective leverage point in a system. She wrote that if no paradigm is right, you can choose whatever one will help you achieve your purpose. So by seeing paradigms as inherently incomplete, yet useful ways of understanding the world, we can make conscious decisions as designers to use the right tools for the job. And these conceptual tools can be described as mental models. Mental models are patterns of phenomena that can be understood in the abstract. So different lenses can be applied to the same information in order to allow us to see different dimensions of the system. Of course, mental models are not an obscure concept. They are all around us. This is a list that I found in a book recently. You'll probably recognize some of them. We all already have a lot of mental models that we reference on a regular basis. They're so universal, in fact, that we've codified them in adages that we share frequently. In English, for example, we convey the mental model of systemic resilience through diversification with the adage, don't put all your eggs in one basket. I'd like to um, share one more mental model here, just as an example, it's perhaps a little bit less common, and that is Chesterton's fence. And it comes to us from a parable by G.K. Chesterton, written in 1929. And in it, two men traveling down a road come upon a fence blocking their path. Now the first man, seeing no use for it, begins to move to tear it down. But the second man stops him, saying that before he can tear it down, he must first understand why it was built in the first place. In other words, there's often deeper truths and reasons for why things are the way they are than what we see on the surface. So returning to the slum clearing and the design of Pruvidigo, we can actually apply Chesterton's fence to the stoops of the original neighborhood. And the stoops you see here, those steps leading up to uh, the doorways, they might not look like much, but they were one of many design features that supported social interaction and therefore a stronger community in the original neighborhoods of Pruitt Igo's residents. It turns out that these stoops serve a deep-seated need of our evolutionary psychology. Since the time that these neighborhoods were demolished, neuroscientists and urban theorists alike have identified a reliable behavior shared between humans and a variety of other species called thigmotaxis. And don't let the big word scare you. Thigmotaxis is a weird word that simply describes a preference to stay close to the edges of a space. If you've ever had mice in your home, you'll notice they like to stay close to the walls. Humans do the exact same thing. And it's because we like to feel protected. Thus, people are far more likely to linger when our spaces provide for congregation at the edges of a space. And stoops are an excellent solution to this design problem because they provide a gradient of privacy and a safe and a comfortable perch from which to watch the neighborhood go by. But unfortunately, the modernist architecture of the Pruitt Igo didn't stop to consider the reason for Chesterton's stoop. It was swiftly eliminated and social ties were weakened as a result. Let's look at one more example of Chesterton's fence. In 1999, the Clinton administration here in the US repealed the Glass-Steagall Act which had previously prevented commercial banks from participating in investment banking. And the idea at the time was that this would improve market efficiency and therefore economic growth. But had the Clinton administration stopped to review uh, the principle of Chesterton's fence, they would have known that the Glass-Steagall Act was passed because it was intended to minimize the risk of bank failure following the Great Depression. Fast forward to 2008 and the repeal of Glass-Steagall would be widely credited with economists 
with enabling the banking actions that would ultimately lead to a global financial collapse. So Chesterton's fence teaches us to be really careful about understanding why an existing design exists before we eliminate it. So, okay, mental models are useful for navigating complexity, but how are they created and where can we find them? I think one really useful way of understanding the production of mental models is the DIKW pyramid, which comes to us from the information sciences. And in it, raw data, say from the data collection of a survey, is connected with other data and thus given meaning, creating information. As information is contextualized with other information, it produces knowledge. And as that knowledge is abstracted and reapplied to new concrete applications, it creates wisdom. Each step up the pyramid adds value to the signal below it. And it also abstracts the information to be more generalizable across applications. And we can think of wisdom as the domain of mental models and of each field as having their own pyramid built up over decades and centuries of knowledge production. This map of citations across fields begins to give us a sense of the rich tapestry of wisdom that these fields can provide us. So I'd like to dive into a few of those fields with you and look at the mental models that they've produced. The first one is one that unfortunately we've all become rather familiar with in recent months, brought to us from the field of epidemiology. What I think is really interesting about epidemiology is that this is a field that must understand not only biological relationships, but also social relationships. And the mental model they've provided us is contagion. So as this stochastic spatial SIRS model visualized by Dirk Brockman shows, contagion relies on contact and can even be understood through a few simple parameters like the infection rate, the recovery rate, and the immunity rate. When we look at the behavior of this model, it's easy to see the contagion of a virus, but this exact same model could just as well describe the contagion of interbank collapse or the spread of memes through social media. These are all examples of cascading effects due to strong coupling between components in the system. Let's look at another field, post-structuralist philosophy which gives us a really interesting mental model for understanding relationships of knowledge, not unlike that that we talked about in the DIKW pyramid. This mental model comes to us from the philosopher Gilles Deleuze, who gave us the rhizome. And the rhizome is a kind of inherent information architecture. It borrows from the decentralized and interlaced structure of a class of plants by the same name. Ginger, for example, is a rhizome. So whereas a tree has a definitive source and a hierarchy, a rhizome is a structure that has no defined center and it resists hierarchy. Any point in the rhizome can be connected to any other point in the rhizome. And as we've already seen, knowledge itself is rhizomatic. I challenge you to spot the center of this network. Personally, I, uh, I can't. This concept has really massive implications for the way that we design information systems. Even something as basic and familiar as folders on a computer can be called into question here. This folder structure looks pretty straightforward, but if knowledge is a rhizome, why do all of our knowledge systems force us into these hierarchies? Here, the subfolder behavioral economics lives under the folder economics, but it has just as strong a relationship to psychology. The subfolder monetary policy lives under economics, but it has just as strong a relationship to public policy. And an article about generating, or sorry, generational decision-making is just as much about sociology. And the problem here is that the folder structure doesn't allow us to connect it to both categories easily. It can't really capture non-hierarchical relationships, even though the real world that it's meant to represent is full of them. Let's look at another field, ecology, which has been thinking in systems for a really long time and it's provided us a wide array of useful mental models for understanding complex systems, but perhaps none more fundamental than the feedback loop. Uh, and if you've ever held a microphone to an amplifier, then you, you already know how a feedback loop works. It describes a reciprocal causal relationship between two phenomena. And there's two kinds of feedback loops. In a balancing feedback loop, a phenomena counterbalances one another to keep the system stable. For example, if a population of wild rabbits were to increase, 
the food available for each might decrease until the population stabilizes. In a reinforcing feedback loop, a given phenomena stimulates another phenomenon, which in turn exacerbates the first phenomenon. And this leads the system out of equilibrium. Uh, for example, when a mother in labor's body releases oxytocin, it produces more contractions leading to more pressure on the cervix and thus more oxytocin. And this reinforcing feedback loop continues until the baby's born. And feedback loops are applicable way beyond ecology and biology. They can be chained together into stock and flow diagrams, such as the one shown here describing the chain reactions of urban development. And this stock and flow diagram has plenty of both balancing and reinforcing feedback loops. The stock and flow diagrams are a way to chart the quantitative relationship between phenomena in a system. And they're a really useful way to, comp uh, to map complex territory brought to us from the early days of classical systems theory. Every part of this stock and flow diagram has designers participating in the way that the overall system behaves. The question I think we need to raise is whether or not those designers are cognizant of the way that their corner relates to the rest of the system. Let's look at one more field. Physics, which brings us a mental model called sensitivity to initial conditions. But you may be more familiar with this concept through the metaphor of the butterfly effect, which suggests that the flapping of a butterfly's wing can eventually produce a hurricane on the other side of the world. Sensitivity to initial conditions is a central tenet of chaos theory, which is closely related to complexity theory, and ultimately critiques the idea that systems are inherently knowable at all. Sensitivity to initial conditions implies that critical differences in initial conditions may be so imperceptibly small and yet so critically important to the outcome of the system that predictions about how events unfold become virtually impossible. And sure enough, this is exactly why we are limited in how far out we can predict the weather. So each of these fields has done the heavy lifting of analyzing data, connecting information, generating knowledge, and accumulating wisdom in the form of new mental models. And today, we tend to think of design as a distinct and parallel field of research and practice. But I want to argue that if we're going to solve big, complex problems, it's important that design begins to look a little less like this and a bit more like this. Remember, Danella Meadow's number one leverage point in systems, the ability to transcend paradigms. To see all conceptual tools as tools with different strengths and weaknesses in different applications and contexts. So I wanna ask what could be accomplished if design looked more like the convergence and application of wisdom across these different fields? What would happen if design education took a more radically polymathic stance? And I admit that this, this may seem like a really lofty goal and it's certainly a difficult one, but I think that if we're gonna solve the complex problems that humanity faces, then it seems paramount that we must first understand what it means to be human. And the human experience is so massively multidimensional that it forces us into the vastly weird and different territories of these variety of fields. Of course, you are only one person, as am I, and the world of knowledge beyond us is so vast that we could spend a whole lifetime hunting for mental models and still have major, even catastrophic blind spots. Now, it's really tempting to find this tragic, but the social scientist Scott Page gives us a way out, and that is to diversify our teams as much as possible, to create what he calls ensembles of wisdom from many people with many mental models. Okay, so we've walked through ways to build and mine mental models from a variety of fields. We've talked about stitching them together to create ensembles of wisdom, but I, I will admit these are sort of meta tools, right? The question remains, what does complexity science mean to us as designers in the day-to-day? -day? So I'd like to close out with a few thoughts on how we can design for emergence. And there's a central tension here, I think, which is brought about because design is usually thought of as a top-down process of control, right? We, we identify desirable outcomes and we control as much of the ultimate process as we can to achieve that outcome. But Designing for emergence means flipping that script. It means opening up the possibility space, not by dictating and controlling outcomes, but by empowering people to create their own solutions 
uniquely adapted to their particular needs and contexts. It's the difference between giving a child a playhouse they'll grow out of and giving them a Lego set with which they can build anything. In 1968, the mathematician turned architect Christopher Alexander described this kind of design as systems generating systems. He argued for a new approach, one that moved away from the design of objects and instead towards what he described as whole systems. And he used the metaphor of language to convey this idea. A very small and simple set of letters can interact to create hundreds of thousands of words. Those words, of course, can combine to create a nearly infinite range of sentences, which can form paragraphs and so on. From the foundation of a few simple shapes, any one of us can produce a vast array of rich and complex meanings. Similarly, all the billions of permutations that can be built from a Lego set, the boats and the skyscrapers and the rocket ships and the horses are all the outcome of this very simple component we see here, which interacts with other components in pretty simple ways. Design for emergence though is hardly just a thing for children's toys. Consider a tool that we all probably use with some regularity, digital spreadsheets. Unlike most software, which is designed to perform a really constrained set of functions, spreadsheets are a general purpose technology. A simple array of cells, which can hold only a handful of data types, can be rearranged in so many ways that a single tool can replace dozens and maybe hundreds of other would-be applications, and yet it's simple enough to use without an IT department. This is designed for emergence. But designing for emergence isn't just for tools and toys and software. We can apply it to our own development through education. My favorite example here actually comes straight from Italy with uh, Maria Montessori, who developed the Montessori method of teaching in Rome at the turn of the century. And the Montessori method of education is it's open-ended and it's self-guided. Rather than direct instruction, children are provided with a wide array of learning activities and given the agency to choose for themselves what interests them. It was Dr. Montessori's belief that children are wildly strong-willed in their pursuit of learning by nature. And the question is whether teaching environments are gonna foster that curiosity or not. The space of the classroom is a major component of the design of the Montessori method with materials organized by subject around the room. Even the placement of learning materials on the shelves is considered, making sure that age appropriate material is placed within reach of younger children, while material for older children is a little bit higher. It's an environment dedicated to discovery and experimentation, or if you like, to the building of mental models and ensembles of wisdom. Rather than the child being instructed to, paying to, to pay attention to the teacher, the teacher observes and follows children around the classroom, supporting their learning and nurturing their curiosity in accordance with the method. It's worth noting these ideas were so radical for their time that when they finally made it over to the United States, the American intelligentsia basically banished them and it was about 50 years until they finally returned to find a more welcoming environment. And Maria Montessori understood that she was designing for emergence. She once wrote that, we discovered that education is not something which the teacher does, but that it is a natural process which develops spontaneously in the human being. So in all of her decades of highly rigorous scientific studies, she found that when children are empowered, order emerges from disorder. And I personally think this is the ultimate example of designing for emergence because the results that is the adult minds that the method produces are clearly generators of new ideas and ways of seeing the world. For example, both Helen Keller and Anne Frank received Montessori educations. And you may recognize these organizations. All of their founders attended Montessori schools as children. And I would argue that a big part of Google's success is the cultural lessons of Dr. Montessori while Wikipedia itself is a magnificent example of design for emergence. Of course, Dr. Montessori did not design her method of teaching to produce Amazon and Google and Wikipedia, but ultimately it did. She didn't plan for that outcome, uh, nor did she believe that she could. And this is where I think it's important to note that designing for emergence demands humility. 
When we design this way, we discard the idea that all knowledge is held exclusively by the designer. And instead, knowledge is embedded in the system. So both designer and user form an ensemble of wisdom. And it shifts from being about top-down control to bottom-up influence. Rather than constraining the end user, we empower them. So back to the big question, can design solve big, complex problems? Again, I think the answer is yes, and I see three major steps that we can take to get there, beginning with recognizing complexity when we see it. In resisting the temptation to fall into oversimplified and mechanistic explanations, excuse me, of the world, and uh, in appreciating the power of complex systems. Second, we can build ensembles of wisdom, both within ourselves and our teams. And in doing so, we can begin to transcend paradigms and see the world through many lenses. And lastly, we can design for emergence by empowering the end user of our designs and enabling adaptations to proliferate. By resisting the temptation to control, we can let innovation and beauty flourish naturally. I'd like to close with a quote from Christopher Alexander that I think captures our charge really well. He wrote that when you build a thing, you cannot merely build that thing in isolation. You must repair the world around it and within it so that the larger world becomes more coherent and more whole. The thing takes its place in the web of nature as you make it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Casey. Thank you also for quoting Maria Montessori. It's a very highly regarded uh, Italian. It was it has when I was a kid. It was actually on the one thousand uh, lira banknote before we had the euros. So it's a very familiar oh, wow. image for a lot Over. of Italians. And, and there was also a great story a couple of years ago in. Uh, in Wired magazine about the Montessori Mafia, because all of the guys that, as you mentioned, uh, uh, most of the guys who, who uh, made Silicon Valley big, yeah, at least the second generation, come from uh, Montessori education. So uh, some, a couple of questions have been coming in, and uh, I think you answered some with your the latest part of your presentation. But um, we have uh, quite a few about uh, what are good examples you gave. You mentioned Google, Amazon, Wikipedia is fantastic. And uh, uh, we, I love Wikipedia because it shows how, I mean, it goes on and on and it has become a, yeah. a genre, a template for many other uh, uh, experiments. Uh, but uh, maybe you could, uh, could expand a bit on what can be designed, especially on the emergence part. Uh, because there's a lot of talk, especially right now with this crisis, with this uh, COVID pandemic, about uh, how we should redesign our cities, our services. We should be living in neighborhoods and in buildings. But so this goes back, touches on, on several points of your presentations, uh, pre Igo as well, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thank you for the great question. Um, I think, you know, if I'd had more time, uh, and I already spent quite a bit of time talking, but if I'd had more time, I would have loved to um, get into um, those lower level rules that agents um, respond to and behave according to in complex systems. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not the case that complexity is inherently good. It simply is the world we live in, right? I mean, we can look at plenty of examples where um, complex systems have led to um, you know, less than ideal social outcomes. Uh, we could point to certain aspects of social media uh, to, to see that rather clearly. We can look at, uh, you know, the proliferation of a virus, for example, which um, we can all agree is uh, not exactly a scenario we, we prefer to be in. Um, but in social systems in particular, uh, what I think we can do as designers is uh, think about those low level rules and the behaviors by which uh, agents or people are responding to in systems and, and think ahead to what are the nth order effects, what are the unintended consequences of those rules uh, in the system, right? Because um, it's not a matter of top down. And, and you know, the current pandemic is a, is a great example of this, where um, 
uh, it, certainly in, in some countries more than others, but we, we see that uh, governments are instituting certain policies and reactions um, to the crisis, but that's not the whole story. It's not a top-down thing. Every individual is responding according to their own understanding of, of the landscape in front of them. So they're responding not only to what the government is telling them to do, they're responding to their own immediate environment. They're responding to the fact that their neighbors are or are not wearing masks, right? Um, and we have a sort of path dependence uh, according to that. And we have, to, we have to bear that in mind that this is a complex system. Um, and, and people are not necessarily going to simply follow the path of whatever the top-down designers had in mind. Um, and so uh, it becomes really critical for us to think about, you know, those nth order effects, um, the rules by which that individuals are responding to in their environment uh, and any outcomes of those rules. And I think one, one factor that I, I find really interesting, um, uh, David Krakow, our president of the Santa Fe Institute, uh, was recently talking about this. Um, and the Santa Fe Institute, by the way, is a fantastic organization that's been doing complexity science for a very long time, for those who aren't familiar. Um, but he talked about the R naught, right? We're all now familiar with the R naught, the, the infection rate of the virus itself, which is both a biological number in the sense of um, how readily transmissible the virus itself is upon contact, but also uh, a socially determined number um, by virtue of our contact with each other. And what, what scientists are, are quite interested in here is that, you know, when, when R naught is high, when it's above one, and therefore transmissions are growing, um, we tend to, you know, we have the data now, we, we get to see that, that uh, numbers are going up and we respond to that. Governments respond to it, individuals respond to it, bringing the number down and hopefully bringing it down below one so that we can begin to kind of uh, stamp out the virus, right? But as soon as it goes below one, restrictions are lifted, certainly in the US, restrictions are lifted, people begin to behave a little bit more loosely and it begins to go up closer to one again and perhaps surpass one. Um, and so, you know, the, the example that, uh, that Krakauer gave uh, in a recent interview was, you know, contrasting this dynamic with um, something like the ocean, right? Which of course has a, a, a very high boiling point, but its equilibrium is nowhere near that boiling point. So it doesn't reach a phase transition. The virus is quite different from that, right? Because the phase transition point, R0 equals one, is in fact um, the, the, an attractor, right? If we're below it, we're attracted towards it. If we're above it, we're also attracted towards it. And so there's this sort of disequilibrium that results, um, but it's the result of us responding to the emergent macro phenomena uh, in our environments. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's quite... Uh... Uh, fascinating having uh, the association with complexity. You can play a lot, you can connect a lot of things I see. Um, okay. uh, we have a, another set of questions about uh, uh, more, let's say, on the down to the ground questions about uh, how can an organization uh, adopt a complexity mindset? I think this is interesting. It also goes back to what uh, Thomas Pren was saying the first evening about uh, getting uh, organization to have a, he was talking about an innovative mindset, but I guess it goes in the same way because you sort of have to switch gears and it's not uh, always easy when you have a structured group of people. Yeah, absolutely. This is difficult. Um, and, it's, and it's difficult in part because um, organization at large have been sort of steeped in that scientific reductionist thinking for a really long time, especially in tech, um, but, but really across, across the design world. Um, there's there, one, one thing I would say is back to that point about ensembles of wisdom, right? Um, having diversity on our teams isn't just sort of a, a feel good thing. It, it actually is critical in order for us to reduce our blind spots and see the outcomes of our impact on the complex system. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, on my, my team, um, Augmented Reality and Google Maps, we, um, uh, we've been fairly successful so far. I don't want to speak too soon. It's a new team. But um, the success that we have had, I, I would say, is in part due to having a really diverse array of people and different backgrounds 
uh, on the team. Uh, our lead designer came from industrial design. I came from city planning. Uh, we're not all people who only worked in augmented reality our entire lives. It's a bit of a broader uh, uh, look, and I, and I think we've done a good job because of it. Um, so I think what's really critical is for organizations to sort of look beyond the template of, you know, oh, we are, we are building uh, uh, refrigerators. We should find people who have only ever built refrigerators. You're going to, you know, that's a terrible example, but, you know, there's, um, there's an opportunity almost always to bring in people with a diverse array of mental models um, and, and to be able to see the complex systems that we interact with in a much more holistic way. Uh, because of that. So I do think that is, I mean, if there's one takeaway, I think for organizations, uh, it, it's actually about diversity. Um, I like it that you always go back to diversity and to the social and, and human side of this, uh, although you actually are working in tech in, in, in one of the, probably the largest tech company in the world, one of the largest tech companies in the world, as Google is. Um, so I would like to ask you, uh, and these are really the final questions because we're almost got four minutes left here. Sure. Um, so what is, what does digital bring to this? Is, is it an enabler? Are digital technologies an enabler? Or do they uh, sort of get in your way? Uh, are they, do they push you to be a reductionist? And, uh, and the other one coming from the audience, our audience is, uh, uh, is really um, advises for, for the road here. W what are the tools to interpret mental models? Like you, you touch upon this, uh, I guess, several times when you spoke about ensembles, but, uh, and again, talking about diversity, but uh, if you can bit, be a bit more precise and for you know, further readings, uh, as a closing part. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I would say uh, digital networks, they, they change everything in, in, in pretty profound ways. I don't think I need to convince anyone of that. Um, there's a, a model that was produced uh, by a gentleman, I believe his name was David Ronfeldt uh, in the Rand Corporation called the TIMN model, T-I-M-N. And in it, he basically argued that we have gone from uh, the a tribal society, that's the T, and then over time we grafted on institutions, the I. And on top of that, later we added in markets, the M, and only recently are we adding in networks. And what's really important to understand is that we're not transitioning, we're not leaving behind tribes, we're not leaving behind institutions, we're not leaving behind markets, we're actually adding to them, which of course introduces a whole wide array of, uh, of complexity. Um, and so today, of course, we're in, we're in a network environment, and it's an environment in which um, geography and space, which once created a lot of friction and allowed different environments to sort of evolve um, um, independent of one another, are now interacting, right? So we have um, very hyper-local political conflicts, which become symbols of a global conflict in a way that they never could before because of the sort of wormholing effect that happens in networks. Um, and so I think this is really important to understand and, and it gets all the more complex because again, it's built on top of markets and institutions and tribes, which is maybe the one that's most closely uh, embedded to sort of the, the base of our brain stems is, is, is that sort of tribal thinking. Um, and so I find that to be a good way of thinking about the, the role of digital and the way that it changes our social uh, systems. Um, yeah, so could you, could you remind me the second question? You had a second question, and I want to make sure I answer it correctly. I have to mute myself. Um, basically, what, what else would you suggest for uh, further readings? I mean, this is such a vast, uh, uh, a vast area of research. Uh, there's so many things that there's one book about uh, um, Stephen Berlin Johnson, I love that it's from a couple of years ago, more than 10 years ago, I guess, Emergence. And that was, I guess, uh, uh, one of the first books on, on, on Emergence. But uh, of course, you can advise uh, us on, on where to look. Absolutely. And that's a great one. It's, um, it's very, it's a, he's a fantastic storyteller. So it's a real fun read. It's I love not, it. 
Yeah, not, not nearly as dry as a lot of the other stuff, I'll be honest. Um, um, you know, there's some, I mentioned Melanie Mitchell, uh, who's a computer scientist and author. She has a book called Complexity, which uh, I think it does a really good job of introducing the field and kind of demystifying certain things about it. It's Melanie Mitchell. Um, another, which is um, not explicitly about complexity, but ultimately it is, which is uh, Seeing Like a State by James Scott. And this is, um, you know, uh, a book that has uh, had major ripple effects about um, effectively, you know, the, the failure pattern of scientific reductionism paired with state power. Um, and it's not explicitly state power. He also mentions, you know, this could just as easily be a matter of corporations, but any large institutional power which needs to map a complex territory, but in doing so, they sort of, um, they oversimplify it. And then they lay their own map on top of it. And this creates all sorts of problems. So the example that he gives in that book is scientific forestry uh, in, in Prussia around, I believe, the turn of the century, perhaps earlier. Um, and, and he talks about how these forests, which have been relied on for their timber, um, end up being, um, you know, unreliable in their natural state for the purpose of timber production. Um, so what they did instead was they cleared the forest and then planted rows of a single crop of trees so that they could control the output um, of timber for this forest. And for a while it works okay, but ultimately it leads to total ecological collapse because the complexity that undergirded the system is gone. So anyway, I, I highly recommend seeing like a state. Daisy, I have to stop you because our time is really up and uh, our, our directors are telling me that they have to launch uh, the next video and uh, Excellent. we don't want overtime in other, in, the, in other people's slot. But thank you again. It's been thank excellent. You. Hope you to get you into Milan for one of our other editions uh, and uh, take care. And for the audience, we'll be back at uh, 6.30 p.m. tomorrow night. Uh, and of course, from 12.30, you can tune in the channel here with the, for the, all the other contents. Have a good evening. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Excellent. Thank you. Goodbye.